Good morning, church. How's everybody doing this morning? So that rain's a little, a little cold on my neck. I'm not sure how uh, Pastor Lance can walk out, out there in that rain. But uh, you guys want to go ahead and uh, ride to your feet and we'll get started. Well, Father, we thank you for this time, Father God. This morning that we have to, to gather together, Father, as one body under you, Father God, as a, as a church family, Lord. And we want to uh, welcome you here this morning, Father God, as we dive into worship, Lord. In your name we pray. Amen.
Oh 
Well, Father, this morning, God, we, God, we thank you. Father, for who you are. God, I don't know if we quite understand how good how good it is to to know that like what this song was saying, God, you will forever God, you will forever be ours. God, thank you. Father, this morning, God, we just praise you. Lord, I just pray that this morning, Father, for our community. Father, as God, as there's a a storm coming through right now, Father. Lord, we're blessed to be able to be in this place, Father, but there's a lot of people that aren't. So, Father, we just want to lift up our community right now for safety. Father, we do pray, God, that you would be theirs as well. You would be with them. thank you, God, for who you are. Lord, I pray, God, that even for I myself, it's on my heart, Lord, I pray that I would really get a better understanding of what it means, God, to have you forever be mine. Father, we pray your your blessing over the rest of this service, over the word. God, we pray that you open our hearts to receive this morning. Father, to be blessed by what you've spoken. God, to be changed as we leave this place. Father, we thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, worship team. Um, As Jared was uh, praying there, I was just reminded um, this whole thought about heaven and eternity, and it sounds like a really cool place. Um, Sometimes we forget eternity starts when we accept Christ as our Savior. That's when relationship happens and no matter where that relationship plays out because we think heaven is eternity and heaven's I mean I don't want to shake you guys all up here but the end of the Bible talks about a new earth and new Jerusalem and Christ reigning what we picture as heaven is probably not where eternity is spent It's just a small little piece of the pie before, you know, he gets into, and and I know I'm talking about, you know, the book of Revelation where he purges the earth and brings down the new Jerusalem, and maybe we don't all have a perfect understanding of that book, but the reality is, is heaven as we know it as another location is a very short period of time in the grand scheme of things and yet we we like form our whole life around trying to get to a place that's actually quite temporary would you even want to be there if Christ wasn't there so wherever he makes his throne isn't that where you want to be there well has he placed his throne in your heart 
so eternity actually begins when you come into relationship with him. It doesn't begin when you change your address from this earth to heaven. And I was reminded of that as Jared was praying, talking about, God, you're forever mine. It's because you, he's not more yours then than he is right now. He's not going to do something different to be in a better relationship with you later after you die. He, he didn't come experience the cross so that you could have him in a greater degree in some other time into the future. There's no cross needed for that. The cross was needed so that relationship could be ob obtained currently. Forever starts now. This is my point. Why wait? <clears throat> um, if you have your Bibles, you can open them to First John uh, chapter 4. And while you're doing that, I'm going to just hit a couple quick announcements um, here. Wednesday nights, don't forget we have the Bible study next door. Those, those are great nights. Uh, there's uh, digging into the study of the book of John, so come and participate. That's 7 o'clock next door. Also want to remind uh, everyone who has not, we're only one week into the marriage home group, so it is not too late. See Quinn if you need a book. Uh, the books are 15 bucks. It uh, takes place at Leyland and Amanda's house, so get with them as far as an address. Um, so, so week two is coming up. So make sure that you've, you know, it's one chapter a week. It's simple. Make sure that you're doing uh, reading through uh, chapter two and, and ready for that uh, marriage home group. That is February 15th at 7 p.m. It's the third Thursday of every month. And so, and you all know that the third Wednesday is uh, our worship and prayer night, and so that'll be happening just the day before here at 7 o'clock. So Wednesday night Bible studies for three weeks out of the month, and then the third, the third Wednesday is our worship and prayer night. So come and join us for that. I, uh, Quinn and I have had a, uh, the last seven or eight days um, have, have, have been going in a lot of different directions. Of course, we have uh, a bunch of wonderful time with family. Of course, Quinn's family is here, so we're blessed by that. We were blessed a few days ago um, by, by my sister from Montana. We have done a couple different Bible studies. I know the ladies uh, last Saturday had their they're gathering. Uh, there's just been a lot going on. There's even been um, earlier in the week, Quinn and I, you know, had the opportunity to really have, to spend the bulk of a day really having kind of heart-to-heart -heart conversation um, in, in talking about, you know, the realities of our life, our marriage, where God is in the middle of that, where he's taking it. There's been, this week has been uh, a lot of different directions. But for the last seven or eight days, in everything that I keep seeing God doing, and, and even in the, in the ways of being able to spend time with family, and uh, God keeps bringing this question up in my mind. I. Uh, Every day, I've had this question rolling around in my mind, uh, and I'm seeing it answered by all the different conversations that I've been having with all, you know, all kinds of different people. I even meet with, have coffee with guys down at the coffee shop and stuff, and, I, and I'm seeing them answer the question that I'm not asking. Uh, I'm hearing it, I should say. I hear them constantly. I'm, I'm going to pose that question to you, and, and I want you to be thinking about how would you answer this question, which would probably take the form of several different options, but simply put, it's this. Uh, what are you, or what are people using most in the defining of their, uh, you could
can say identity or purpose. What do people and what do you use most to define why you're here? Like, if I were to say it a different way, I could say it, if God has a plan for you in your life, he has a plan and a purpose for you, why are you here? Why did he create you? Why did he give the ability, you know, and, and you say, well, you know, mo mom and dad technically <laughs> made me. Um, theology 101. In the beginning, when God created man of the dust of the earth, it says he breathed the spirit of life and man became a living soul. People have the ability to make people, but people wouldn't be living without the breath of life, the spirit, in them. Otherwise, every life would need life support because they would lack the spirit of life. So God gives the ability of life for everything. So, uh, in fact, and it says, you know, that he uh, breathed the spirit, of, the spirit of life into man, and man became a living soul. And, and, and soul, that word soul, in the Hebrew, it means mind, will, and emotion. So where is it do you think that you get your, your wants, your likes, your desires, your your feelings, your hopes, your dreams, where does that stuff come from? It didn't come from just cells being fabricated. It comes from the breath of life. It comes from God himself uh, grafting into you who you're going to be as a person. Like we can all stand here. We all have legs and arms and, and eyes and ear. But, but what is it that makes you think the way that you think or want what you want or feel what you end up feeling? The same thing can happen to two different people, and they can feel completely different about the situation. Why is it that you feel different than anyone else? It's because God has done something in you that made you unique, individual, your mind, your will, and emotion, your soul. So, anyways, back to the question, why did the creator of the universe make you? Why are you here? What is his plan? Like, what is the purpose? Why or what do you use to define your identity? I think in my conversations and just sitting around and, and listening and, and hearing things, I, uh, I recognize that there are things like our strengths, our gifts, our experiences, our careers, our successes, our kids, our passions, our heartaches, our hardships, our hobbies. All these things we use to define my identity. I use to define my identity. What if, what if, you have ever had the thought, well, I, you know, I was actually a mistake. I wasn't even supposed to be born. Okay. So if someone else's mistakes you've used to define your identity. I just want to talk about that today. It's not going to be anything like super profound. Uh, I'm probably not, hopefully, not going to get real preachy. Um, today, but I want us to be thinking about this as we, as, as I share some scriptures, some thoughts to encourage us to kind of refocus what we actually use to define our life. Because most of like everything that I read that we use to define our life are, are they're not, that's not wrong, but it's secondary. And the very most primary things that we should be using to define our identity, who we are, are not our passions. They're not our kids. They're not our hardships. They're not our accomplishments. So when you eliminate that stuff, what's left? What is the, like, what should be defining my identity? 
And that's what I want to talk about today. I'm going to do that through some scriptures. Um, <clears throat> and I think that even as Christians, we get into this uh, thing because, you know, you, you could say, as a, you know, you read the Bible some and, and you pray and, oh, well, I don't, def- I don't use that sort of thing to define my, my purpose of why I'm here. Why am I on this planet? Well, it's to spread the gospel of Jesus, to share the love of Christ. It's to, you know, to be an encouragement to others, to help others, to be an example. We, we could say all these really good answers and I'd say, yeah, secondary. Those are all still secondary things. I think we really miss the uh, the real, the primary purpose, the primary reason, and so, um, so I'm going to do that. But the first thing that I'm going to do today is uh, just to show you this: you actually don't define that. Point number one, if you're taking notes, you can put these down. But point number one is it's very simple: you don't define your purpose. But we work so hard to define our purpose. We, we. We take, you know, every single one of us, and and as God has been kind of questioning me this week, because I could easily say, well, God, I'm, I'm, you, you know, you made me a pastor. That's why I'm here. Is I'm pastor. I'm supposed to teach the word. I'm supposed to, you know, help people understand. I, that's apparently why I'm here. And God would say, really? Is it really why you're here? Is did you choose that? Like, is that your desire? Is that what you wanted to do? I mean, yeah, I love it. We we typically take things uh, and try to define our purpose ourselves. Um, I want to show you a scripture. It's Quinn's favorite verse. The ladies heard it at their gathering, probably um, Proverbs three, verse five and six. And I'm going to read it out of the New Living Translation. And it says this, trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not depend on your own understanding. Seek his will in all that you do and he will direct uh, or show you the path uh, to take. So that sounds good when you read it, especially when you read it kind of fast. It has this feel of trust God and everything's going to work out, right? Trust him and he's going to direct you and it's all going to be good and, and you're going you're gonna to understand you'll be on the right road and, and it's all I, I don't think that's actually what this is saying. I'm going to show you that. Um, be, and, but that's how we read it. Like, hey, just trust God. It's all going to work out. It's all going to be good. You know, you'll have a good job. You'll have a good life. You'll, you'll have uh, your career, whatever it is. Uh, that's not what the, the writer here is writing. Proverbs is the book of wisdom. It's written by the, mo- the, by the most wise. God declared the most wise man to ever live. And this is one of the little nuggets that he has that he put in this book that the Spirit led him to put in this book. And so trust here, I'm just going to define three words in this. Trust here means, this Hebrew word means confident, secure, sure, or careless. Not careless like just being crazy and not thinking about anything, but it actually means carrying no burden. Like you have no care, you have no weight, you have nothing holding you back because you've completely trusted in something else to carry the burden, carry the weight. So to trust, so when it says trust in the Lord, it means total confidence, security, no burdens, everything, you're just, you're putting it on his plate. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. This is also the same word that we've already talked about, which is your mind, will, and emotion. So the inner man, it's the soul. It's the depth of who you are as a person. Like, everything that I, my mind, so it's everything that I think that I seek to know, right? Intelligence. It's, it, it's the intellect, it's everything that makes me me is what the heart is. So trust in the Lord with everything to the depths of my most inner being. And lean not or don't depend on my own understanding. Understanding here is specifically one portion of the heart. Or the soul. It's one portion of that. 
it's everything that you know. Everything that your mind can get a, a grip on. Everything that you understand. So, so literally, what the writer here is saying, it's not that, hey, trust in God and it's all going to work out. He's actually saying something. I, I, I wrote it kind of in a different way. This is the, the Lance Pruitt translation. All your hopes, wants, all your feelings, everything you understand, knowledge, reasoning, your opinions. Take no security in anything to the depth of your innermost being. With everything that you are, everything that you ever could be, seek God for his direction. Surrender yours and walk in his. It, it, that's a little different than saying, Trust in God, it's all going to work out. Oh, you think you have a, a, a grip on the direction of your life? Kill it. Trust in his direction. You, you have passions, hopes, desires, hobbies. Kill them. Trust in his. Now, I'm not saying that you can't. Like, like Bailey takes me golfing and Tyler and I, I love it. But does that feed into who I am? Is that what I lean on to define my identity? Oh, it's a good time. There's a lot of things that I really enjoy doing. But what is my identity? What is feeding who I am and why I'm here? Point number two is this. After we, and I'm going to just throw it out there and be kind of blunt about it. I'm not going to beat around the bush first thing I just wanted you to know is you don't define yourself. You actually have been called to do something greater than define yourself, is to lay your definition down, to, to lay what you think that you could be on the chopping block and say, God, whatever it is that you want me to be, wherever it is you want me, wherever you want me to go, however you want me to impact this world around me, that's your decision, not mine. Point number two is this. Here's why. Here's the primary purpose. You are here to be loved. It's plain. It's simple. It's, it's all throughout the scripture. But when I said it earlier, what is it that defines your life? You probably had good Christian answers. You maybe had answer you probably got maybe hopefully you got real with yourself and said well yeah my 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 past or my heartaches my experiences good bad my accomplishments my my kids my family there's all these things and and hopefully you were kind of real about yourself but probably not one of you thought even when you're thinking about well I'm here to share the love of Christ or I'm here to be a blessing to people and I'm here to good Christian answers you probably nobody probably thought I'm on this planet because the creator of the universe, it says God is love. It's the, what most theologians believe are the, the, the most profound, the greatest, most important three words of the entire Bible. It's repeated several places, several times. God is love. So because of his, the essence of who he is, his character and nature requires a place to pour that out. A, a, it requires a place to reveal. And so you are here for one simple reason. You are an item. You are a person. You are a place where he can reveal the essence of his nature. He, he didn't need more angels to do everything that he said to do. Right? The Bible says there's tens of millions, like 10,000 times 10,000. I think that's maybe, a, I don't know. That's a lot. He has plenty of those. Um, the commander-in-chief And, well, like if you were on a military base, 
the person on the base with the, the greatest amount of authority does not desire in their heart to show love to the rest of the base because those are soldiers. There, there's a purpose for that relationship. And it's not the purpose of, that's the father to the angelic host. But that's not you. So he had to find a place to express his true nature. So he created man with intention to love man. Of course, when I say man, I'm talking about mankind, man and woman. In 1 John chapter 4, which maybe uh, you're already there in verse 15, it says this. <clears throat> All who declare that Jesus is the Son of God have God living in them, and they live in God. And we know how much God loves us, and we have put our trust in his love. God is love, and all who live in love live in God, and God lives in them. And as we live in God, our love grows more perfect. So we will not be afraid on the day of judgment, but we can face him with confidence, because we live like Jesus here in this world. I, I want to just kind of share a couple things here with this. First of all, like when we, when we have this perspective, when we realize, okay, I'm not here to change the world. Somebody already did. It, his name was Jesus. I'm not here to make a way for anyone to come in relationship with God. Somebody already did that. His name was Jesus. I'm not here to be a light. Somebody already was. His name was Jesus. When you, start, when you honestly start eliminating these things, then, then you, you actually start to realize, listen, I am here for him to love me. And he's the only one, since God is love, he's the only one that, that has a source of perfect love, like love perfected. So that's the only real place that, so when I get his love, I'm not just getting good love. I'm not even getting like, like pretty clean, pure love. I'm getting perfect love. So I'm here so that perfect love can touch me. And, and, and for me, in my hope to love with a perfect love, all that I can be or do is to be a reflection of what I've experienced. That's that, the, the most that you're ever going to do in life, the most impactful that you'll ever be is to reflect that which was perfect when it came to you. Is, is in our, with our greatest hopes is to reflect perfection. I probably am not going to do that well, <laughs> but, but that should be my greatest hope. So my greatest influence on the world around me is literally, it's just going to be like, To receive what he's doing to me, which is loving me. So the harshness that we, 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 get, in our, we get in our minds, we read the scriptures and we, and we think about, well, God did this and God, God was harsh and he, there was vengeance and different things that he was doing. And, and I think we, uh, we don't understand when you look in the scriptures and you see the harshness of God, the justice of God, it's always on the person who represents a hindering to him being able to love his people. And so when you, when you come in between the person that has called Jesus Lord and the love of the Father, when you get yourself in between there and you begin becoming a hindrance or an oppression, then it fires up the wrath of God and the vengeance of God and the justice of God because he is not... Uh, okay with anyone getting into the gap between his love and his chosen his people and so and it, it, it actually when it says here i'm going to reread it, it says all those who declare that jesus is the son of god has god living in them and they live in god and we know that how much he loves us it doesn't say that he does not love those who have not called on the name of jesus 
So he, it says those are the ones who actually know how much he loves them. Those are the ones who know it. And I would, I would venture to say most of us don't even have a clue. And I'm definitely in that boat. Like, I realize, like, God is showing me regularly, you know, you, you thought I loved you, you thought you had it, like, your understanding, you understand the love of God. Really? You think so? I'm the creator of the universe. You are what I have grafted, and you think you have my full understanding. Back to Proverbs. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding because when you get outside of your capacity to understand, now you get into just the basics of the working of God. Mankind and all of our understanding, we can't take our hands and create a teaspoon of dirt. We can't take nothing and make a teaspoon of dirt. In the greatest intellectual minds that have ever lived. You can't take, we can't take nothing and make a teaspoon of dirt. Outside of our understanding is where God actually just starts to begin to work. And he draws us in this way of like pursue this that you have no capacity to even obtain but pursue it. No matter how painful or disappointing life has been or how passionate you are, is God the one defining your identity? Is God the one that's defining why you're here? And I think all of it, it's just uh, today, it's just an encouragement, a simple encouragement why look to the things that you have a really good grip on? Or maybe you've been a great parent and your kids are doing well. Maybe you have a lot of accomplishments. I, I've met even recently with, with people who are very successfully retired people that have had an incredible career and they're like, I, I have no idea like where my life is going now. I've, I, I'm lost. I, I need, like, I'm just lost. I'm floundering. Oh, huge retirement accounts. H huge list of accomplishments. But literally lost. Don't know what to do. Don't know where. It's like retire or the kids get grown. And you see this, and people are like, I don't even know where, where is my life going right now. I, I think it's because they've defined their life. And something profound happens, like every year you get that opportunity, a life-changing event, change your medical insurance. There should be no life-changing event that changes your identity. There should, that should never happen. It, did, it does if you defined your life, you defined your identity and your purpose, Oh, sure, some big life-changing event happens and everything changes. But if you don't lean on your understanding and you actually lean on his direction, then you're never without an identity and purpose. Point number three, which I've already kind of alluded to, but uh, it's this, it's you need to accept. You need to... Um, I think this is maybe where up until this point it's all like yeah I, I get that I get that I understand that I, I, can, I can take that I think this is where most people struggle I think this is even where I see most people like in the church that want to, you know, like Lance, I need, we need to talk. I need to, you know, going through some things. 
and I'm wondering, boy, have we, do we really receive the love of God? Do we really accept his love? Even if I told you and told you and told you and, and I feel like God is telling me and telling me and telling me and I'm all the time going back to him and saying, questioning my identity. God, do you love me? Okay, so maybe I'm the only one in here. But have you ever asked God to forgive you for more, more than one time for the same thing? <laughs> that's, that's my life. Uh, ask him to forgive me more than one time on the same thing. Okay, so apparently I didn't receive his love in its fullness the first time. Because if I understood what his love actually represented, I would understand that when he, when he strips me of that sin and that burden and cleanses me, I would, if, if I knew to the, to the degree in which he cleanses me, I would never come back thinking I'm still dirty. But that's how most of us operate. We need to receive by faith the greatness of his love that he has for us. And let that be the defining factor of our identity, of our life. There, there is an equation. I think it's, there's an equation for understanding his love or, or I should say maybe more understanding it. It's another verse in the Bible. It's ask, seek, knock. You're not going to get it in one foul swoop. I, you know, I, I pray and pray and pray and pray, and you're going to pray and pray and pray and pray. God, help me to understand your, your great love for me. Help me to understand how much you've actually forgiven me. Help me to understand how much you really have cleansed me. And you're going to ask it more than once. But instead of repeatedly going back for the same thing, trying to get clean of something that you've been cleaned and you're really not carrying it unless you have gone back and picked it up. Instead of doing that, why don't we start going to God and saying, God, what is it that you actually have done in me? Maybe I don't even feel that different. But you said you did something. You said you threw my sin as far as the east is from the west. You've thrown it that far from me. Not from you, from me. All right? it, it, God has no problem taking hold of your sin and holding it for the rest of his life, which is eternity, holding it in his hand. He has no problem doing that. He doesn't need to throw it away from him. He needs to get it away from you. And that's where our understanding, I think, is so limited. It's that we... We really don't know the, the greatness of what he's actually accomplished in us. And so we go to him repeatedly trying to feel different instead of accepting what he's done and going to him to asking for help. Help me to understand what it is you've actually done. Instead of going to him and saying, God, you're going to have to do it again because the first time maybe didn't work. I, that's how, how I've been. I'm going to read Ephesians chapter 3 uh, out of the, the Passion Translation, uh, verses 16 through 20. And I'm just going to kind of read it slowly. And I'm, I think this is maybe one of the most beautiful uh, portions of the Scripture. And I want you to just hear it. Um, as I read through this, just, just like try to let this absorb some in our minds, and in our hearts. And this is Paul, and he's saying, I pray. And, and, and first, uh, I'll say that just before this, you know, in Ephesians, he's, he calls the Ephesian, the church of Ephesus, the faithful followers, the faithful followers of Jesus. These are, these are faithful Christians. Are you faithful Christian? I mean, most of us would uh, like humbly say, well, I don't, no, I don't do that good. You're faithful. You're here in the middle of a storm on a Sunday morning pouring down rain. You, you're part of the church, not Glen Ellen. You're part of God's family. 
So this is what Paul is praying to people like you and like me. He says, I pray that he, God, would unveil within you the unlimited riches of his glory and favor. To me, that sounds like, ooh, he loves me. The unlimited riches of his glory and favor until the supernatural strength floods your innermost being with his divine might and explosive power. So he's, he's saying, I, I'm praying that there would be an unveiling of your soul and, and the riches of the glory that's unlimited, the majesty of God in its unlimited nature would pour into you, into the depths of your innermost being, and the favor of God would give you strength, and it would flood you with a power that you never experienced. Now, this is So he's thinking like, God is capable of doing something like beyond our imagination, and I'm hoping and praying that he's going to do it in you to the depth of who you are. And this is what I hope actually comes out of this explosive power and might and majesty hitting and touching your soul. Let's see what happens. By, the constant, by constantly using your faith, the life of Christ would be released deep inside of you, not outside of you, not through you. Inside of you is where the life of Christ needs to be released. You don't need to release Christ to the world. Christ needs to be released in you. The world's going to see the change. The world's going to have impact. You're, you, know, you, you can't be the same as you were before you had the life of Christ in its fullness deposited into your soul. You're not going to go around the same way. So don't worry about what you're doing with the world so much. That's not defining who you are. But if Christ is deposited in you, the life of Christ, and, and look here, it says, in the resting place of his love will become the very source and root of your life. You need the life of Christ revealed to the innermost part of your being and the love of him becoming a resting place in you and out of that is the root, the foundation, the rock. Everything that ever is developed in you has to come from this, this alone. That his love becomes the source and the root of your life. If his love is not the source and the root of your life, then your building is not built, your life is not built to the fullness of what it could be. It's probably built on a lot of pretty good things. None of them match this. None of them. Then you'll be able to discover what every holy one experiences, that, that just means anyone that's set apart, holy is set apart. That's a believer. So, so here's the hope, is that you're going to experience the great magnitude of the astonishing love of Christ in all of its dimensions. It'd be really easy to, like, we're going to do an impartation service. I'm going to pray that you would have gifts and abilities and you'd go around and change the world around you. And that would be awesome. And we could do it and we could, you know, line up and everybody pray for everybody. And, and if you don't get this, then you're never full, walking in fullness, living in fullness, the life that you were created to have. When we talk about what's my purpose, like what am I, what do I, God, what do you want me to do in this world? Here's the first thing. All of the other things are going to flow out. And maybe you're like me and, I, and I'm like, okay, my kids are grown and I'm just now starting to see this, God. Uh, it's a little late. No, <laughs> no, it's not. Maybe you're like me. You did the best that you could with the revelation, with the understanding that you had. But God is saying, from here on out, we're going to change things. We're going to shift things. You're going to operate out of 
a revelation of my love for you, that's what you need to shift into and adjust to. So, uh, <clears throat> so the great magnitude that, you know, that we'll be empowered to discover the great magnitude of the astonishing love of Christ in all its dimensions. How deeply intimate and far-reaching is his love. How enduring and inclusive it is. Endless love beyond measurement. Uh, Paul is just, he's just repeating, repeating. And, and of course, he's only writing what the Holy Spirit is in, inspiring him to write. So, endless love beyond measurement. That transcends our understanding. There it is. We're so limited in our understanding, yet we've elevated it. We're a world of knowledge. Like, knowledge is king. What we know is king, right? You know, the, whatever science, it's like, that's king. Remember that the earth was flat until a few hundred years ago. When 3,000 years ago, the scriptures called it a severe two different times. Science always, knowledge, understand, always as it presses forward, presses into the wisdom of the way God has already been operating in forever. All we do is get glimpses. We, we have this totally, this, this perverted mindset of thinking it's God and, versus science. If science is accurate, it's always going to line up with the Creator. It always is going to end up proving, okay, he knows what he's doing. They're never against each other. Where is the source of that? Where is the source of knowledge and understanding? It's him. So many things. Okay, endless love beyond measurement. Where was I at? <clears throat> His, uh, how enduring and inclusive it is, endless love beyond measurement that transcends our understanding. This extravagant love pours into you until you are lifted to overflowing with the fullness of God. The love of Christ revealed to our hearts is where the fullness of God lies. You're not walking in fullness of God. We, we have no capacity to obtain that if we don't first press for the re, this receiving this understanding of the of the love of God the love of Christ verse 20 uh, never doubt God's mighty power to work in you and accomplish all this this is huge because we've just declared like how incredible this love is and how mighty and how never ending and it, it's just it's but don't doubt that the same power that has that love has the ability to work in you to accomplish this in you why would you think that god can't accomplish this unmeasurable, immeasurable love. It can be accomplished in you by the same working power. So, never doubt God's mighty power to work in you and to accomplish all this. He will achieve infinitely more than your greatest request, your most unbelievable dream, and exceed your wildest imagination. Well beyond where your mind is able to go is where he wants to work in you. you. Let me say it like this. When you give him the freedom to come alive in you, you'll look back at yourself and say, I, I would have never thought that was even possible. That's what this is talking about. I, I never would have guessed. I, I had no idea he could do that in me. It was beyond my ability to, to think it, to understand it, to achieve it. And yet, he did it. He did it. The very person that I thought I could never become, I, I, I never thought that I could be this type of husband or this good of a dad or this, you know, I, I just never thought 
it was in me to love someone like this. And here it is. Not perfect, but so much better than what I thought I could ever be. So don't doubt his ability to do it, to do it. Your most unbelievable dream and exceed your wildest imagination, he will outdo them all. For his miraculous power consistently energizes you. There's a couple things I'm I'm done. Worship team can come up. I want to pray for you guys today, but I also want you to, my hope is that that you're thinking about, okay, first of all, what has defined me as a person? Has it been the love of Christ? This, the truly, like I'm here to be loved. Is that the defining the, the, the most defining prominent ingredient in this stew that's called your life, that's full of stuff. Ask yourself that. And if it's not, say, God, I, I need to understand your love. Like, I'm trying every day to be the best that I can be, and I regularly fail. I regularly make mistakes. I regularly, you know, just ask my wife. (laughs) I step in it. My shoes are dirty. Are we asking God regularly? God, so much of the times I'm saying, God, change me. This is not who I want to be. And God's saying, you're exactly who I want you to be. You just don't realize you have the capacity. I think that I think that most of us need a a greater understanding of his love for me. And then out of that secondary things. The great good things, great things. But primarily, let's come back to the love of Christ. I promise you, if you're like me, you have no idea how much the Father loves you. You have no idea. And if we did, it would completely change the way we live. It would change the way we love, the way we acknowledge, the way we respond, the way we think, the way we reason. It would change everything. It would change the way you talk to your spouse. It would change the way you talk with your kids. You'd, it would change the way you deal with circumstances. It would change your value system of what's a priority in my life. So, Heavenly Father, I just come before you. And, Lord, the question I hope to answer today by your leading God is also the question that I'm I'm wanting you to answer for me personally God that there would be a revelation hit my heart my soul that I would have a greater understanding of, Lord, who I am to you. Lord, I know who you are to me, my Savior. But who am I to you? It seems so easy. We think sometimes, why did Jesus come to die on the cross? Well, he came for me. He didn't need to come die on a cross for himself. But God, I... I've either pushed that to the side or 
for lack of understanding, I just forge ahead my own way, making my life exactly what I want it to be. Calling on your name here and there and, and, and doing my best to live for you. But, but doing life my way, really. Thinking that, oh, it's, it's this word submit. And I really don't want to submit everything. I really don't want to surrender everything. Or saying I, I do, but then go ahead and do my life my way. Lord, I think it just comes back to we don't understand the essence of your nature, of your character. We don't understand your love for us. I'm reminded of the kids when they're small, so many kids when they're small, constantly lifting their hands up, wanting to be held. When they're hurt or when they're down or when they're scared, They might not have a grip on how much a parent loves them, but all they want to do is run to that love. And we get older and we get mature and we, we pursue our, our lives and dreams and careers and such, and, and God, we quit holding our hands up. We quit seeking to know that love. So, Father, today I, I just pray, God, that you would be piercing our hearts with this redirecting, reestablishing what should really be feeding our identity. We are beloved by the creator of the universe. Pride and insecurity, inferiority, selfishness, doubt and fear. God, all these things would just move away if we would set our eyes back on the fact that we are beloved by, by majesty. Dearly beloved, by the one with all power, all strength, all authority, all might, all dominion, all glory. God, I pray you'd open up our hearts to a new understanding. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's close with worship song so you can stand if you can and join.
have a wonderful week and please stay dry and be careful. In Jesus' name, amen.